um, reflected in gravitationally lensed images around the black hole. So that's uh, activity number five. Uh, activity number six would be to establish an amusement park uh, at the so-called photosphere around the black hole where you can enjoy relativistic effects for fun. For example, you can see your back by looking forward uh, photos that are making a whole circle around the black hole. Uh, activity number seven would be to take advantage of new opportunities for space travel. Uh, for example, uh, when the Milky Way and its sister galaxy Andromeda will merge, the two black holes uh, at their centers will pair into a tight binary that would act as a slingshot uh, to eject stars with planets close to the speed of light. So that, that would be a very nice uh, way to reach uh, high speeds. Um, one can send criminals into the black hole as an ultimate prison. That's uh, activity number eight. Uh, with a death sentence at the singularity. And uh, the mass of the black hole will determine how uh, much time is left for the prisoner's life. So obviously, mm -hmm. if the crime is lesser, the, the more massive would the black hole would be. And so you can tune the, <laughs> the punishment depending on the mass of the black hole. Um, and then uh, one can use gravitational waves uh, from small objects orbiting the black hole for communication. That's activity number nine. Uh, and such signals cannot be blocked. Um, nobody can censor them. And finally, one can test the fundamental aspects of quantum gravity uh, through organized trips for string physics uh, experimentalists, not theorists. <laughs> So uh, these are the 10 fun activities that I could think of if anyone has additional suggestions. I'd be glad to hear them. Uh, and uh, so, Laura. Yes. So it's a great pleasure to have as our first speaker today Harvey Rial. Uh, Harvey is a professor of theoretical physics at the Cambridge University, and he will tell us about the strong cosmic censorship context. Okay. Well, thank you for the uh, invitation to visit here. Um, so I'm going to be talking about strong cosmic censorship. So I'll try and give a fairly gentle overview to the subject today. Uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll say something about recent work that I've been involved with on this topic. If you're interested in hearing more about that work, then I'm giving another talk on Thursday in the physics department at uh, 4 o'clock? 4.15. Four <laughs> okay. Um, so let's consider Einstein-Maxwell theory with a vanishing cosmological constant. So, um, as I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, this theory admits various black hole solutions. So a charged but non-rotating black hole in this theory is described by the, the Rice and Nordstrom solution. And a rotating but uncharged black hole is described by the Kerr solution. And these two solutions have a, a common property, which is that both of them can be smoothly extended across a horizon which is inside the uh, black hole. So it's a Penrose diagram for the, uh, the Rice and Nordstrom or the Kerr solution. So this region here would be the region outside the black hole. So this is future null infinity, past null infinity, spatial infinity. Here's the black hole uh, event horizon. Uh, crossing through the Einstein-Rosen bridge brings us to this other asymptotically flat region over here. Uh, up here is the black hole interior region, and down here is a, a white hole region. And uh, this uh, blue line here is this, this inner horizon I mentioned. Uh, so this is different from the, the Schwarzschild solution, which would end with a singularity inside the black hole. Here for Kerr or Ice and Austria, we have this, this extra uh, horizon. So this, this horizon is called a, a Cauchy horizon because it's a boundary uh, to the region of space-time in which the solution to the Cauchy problem is unique. So what do I mean by that? So the Cauchy problem is the, the initial value problem. So let's think about this space-time from the perspective of an initial value problem. So we want to start with initial data prescribed on some spatial hypersurface, like this surface sigma here, extending from one asymptotic infinity all the way across to the other asymptotic infinity, so the Kerr or the Rice and Nordstrom solution will correspond to some particular initial data on this surface sigma. And if I then evolve that initial data, I will recover the Kerr or the Rice and Nordstrom space time. But it turns out you only recover it up to this inner horizon. Going beyond the inner horizon, there are infinitely many ways of extending the solution 
which are all perfectly smooth, perfectly compatible with the equations of motion. And so this dotted red region up here is, is schematically indicating uh, all, all of these infinitely many possible extensions of the solution. Um, so in fact, in uh, contradiction to what was just said about throwing criminals into a black hole, yeah. the criminal doesn't, doesn't hit a singularity. Instead, the criminal here crosses this inner horizon into a region where physics can no longer be predicted from uh, initial data. Um, so when you first learn about the Kerr or the rice nordstrom solution, you don't usually learn this. Instead, what you learn is some particular way of extending the solution. And that particular way is usually the one that's um, obtained by demanding that the solution should be analytic across this surface. Um, but analyticity is not a physical uh, uh, condition. Um, analyticity says that if you know the solution at one point, you know it everywhere. That's clearly very unphysical. If you just demand smoothness and you just specify the initial data, there are infinitely many possible smooth extensions into this region up here. And in the process by which you make the black hole, does that at all affect the Cauchy? Um, yeah, so, so um, let's imagine, for simplicity, let's take the Rice and Nordstrom case. So you can form Rice and Nordstrom by collapsing a ball of charged dust, for example. Mm -hmm. So that ball would cover up most of this Penrose diagram, so you call the region to the left of my stick. But outside that ball, because of Birkhoff's theorem, the solution would still be Rice and Nordstrom, and so you'd still have this section of Cauchy horizon here, and everything I just said would apply to this section here. And so for that reason, in fact, mostly, most attention in strong public censorship focuses on this early time section of what I call the right component of the Cauchy horizon, because that's the part relevant to gravitational is there any symmetry requirements for the white hole and the black hole? Is well, uh, so far I've just been speaking about two specific solutions of GR, namely Rice and Nordstrom and Kerr. So that they have whatever symmetries they have. But, but uh, I, when I uh, discuss things more generally, there won't be any asymmetries uh, in place. Okay, so uh, I think I've said everything there. So let's now indulge in some philosophical speculations or uh, discussion, because I know there are some philosophers here. Let's start with Newtonian physics. In Newtonian physics, if you specify the initial conditions and velocity, initial positions and velocities of all the particles in the universe, and you know them exactly, then you can use the equations of motion to predict exactly what those particles will do for all subsequent time. Of course, in practice, chaos means that we can't do this, but in principle, at least, the, the laws of physics plus the initial conditions determine evolution for all time. Similarly, if we're looking at Maxwell theory or Yang Mills theory in Minkowski space time, if we specify initial conditions exactly, then the equations of motion determine the solution for all time uh, uniquely. Uh, going to quantum mechanics, in the Schrödinger equation, we specify the initial wave function and we know it exactly, then the Schrödinger equation determines a subsequent wave function for all time. But in contrast, in GR, we've seen that even in situations where we know the initial conditions exactly, um, it can happen that the solution can be smoothly continued into some region where we can no longer predict what happens. And nothing funny happens across this surface, but as soon as we cross it, we can no longer predict what happens, even if we know the initial conditions exactly. So it's a, um, a failure of determinism in, in physics. Okay, so this was first noticed long ago by Roger Penrose, who also identified a possible way out, which is uh, the possibility that uh, this behavior is unstable. In other words, this is a feature of only the Kerr or the Rice and Nordstrom solutions, but not of some perturbation of those solutions. And he also pointed out that there's a, a heuristic reason to expect uh, there to be an instability of the Cauchy horizon, which is that perturbations uh, entering the black hole from outside experience an infinite blue shift at the Cauchy horizon. Here's the standard picture for, for explaining this. Again, this is the region outside the black hole. This is the region inside the black hole. Um, we have two, uh, two observers, Alice and Bob. Alice is immortal. She lives forever. Bob uh, jumps into the black hole and crosses the Cauchy horizon. So Bob's world line is, is finite, so there's a finite proper time to reach here. Alice is sending um, a signal to Bob every second. Since she lives forever, she sends infinitely many signals. 
and Bob receives all of them just before he crosses the Cauchy horizon. This means that the blue shift of these uh, signals must be diverging as Bob approaches the Cauchy horizon. Um, Harvey, wh why would you say this rescues determinism? Um, well, I haven't really explained it yet. Oh, um, you wrote I, it and you moved I, on. I, I, I thought, I, I, uh, I, I'm in the process of explaining why it rescues determinism. Uh, if I don't answer your question, I'll repeat asking it. Um, so if instead of talking about signals, we were to talk about perturbations, this argument suggests that if we have a small perturbation in this region here, when it propagates up to here, it will suffer an infinite blue shift. It will therefore have infinite energy, as measured by an observer such as Bob, which suggests that it's going to have a large gravitational back reaction. And uh, that large gravitational back reaction may well uh, cause this geometry inside the black hole to end at a singularity, rather than having a smooth Cauchy horizon. If it ends in a singularity, we've now rescued determinism, because we no longer have this, this region into which uh, we can propagate without... Uh, but this is everything, I mean, well, why is that rescue? I mean, it's, it, you well, can't yeah. evolve past the singularity. That's There's right. No. So we, don't, we, no, we no longer have this, this, this property of theory breaking down when it has no reason to break down. By the way, it may not be a singularity because you have an infinite energy density, so it's just like the Big Bang. Uh, quantum mechanics may save the day. Well, I'm talking about classical GR. I mean, sure, classical sure, GR, but, but I don't know what a singularity is. So. Right. But, but of course, I mean, if you throw in quantum mechanics, then, then yeah, the story will be different. But I think first we understand the classical problem, and then we can ask, how does quantum theory modify it? But we know that quantum enters because the energy density diverges. Um, eventually, yes, but... Um, I think that you could un you try to understand the classical problem first before then looking at quantum effect on top of that. Did I answer your question, Andy? Yes, but I don't agree with it. <laughs> 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 because you already had a singularity there, the ring singularity, right? No, 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 no. no. Glad, Kerr has I'm a ring glad you said that. I'm glad you said that. Kerr has a ring singularity no, at R equals you're, zero. You're now talking about this <laughs> analytic space-time. If I demand that the space time is analytic across here, then I get to a ring singularity. But no one tells me that space time has to be analytic here. If I only say it has to be smooth, there are infinitely many things that can happen beyond here. And in fact, we, I don't think we know that they all have to be singular. They probably are, but I don't think there's any theorem which guarantees it. Okay. I think it's a weird <laughs> definition of what determinism. I mean, most people would say that determinism breaks down badly with you. Uh, well, the theory breaks down. No, it doesn't break down. It's perfectly smooth here. It's, there's nothing locally telling you that it's breaking. This is, well, this is the worrying thing. Is that the prediction in the Kerr solution, not... everywhere above the blue line is in the, within the causal domain of influence of, of uh, the ring singularity of the origin. It depends on how you define the Kerr You're talking about the maximally analytically extended Kerr solution. So if I just start from Kerr initial data on here, I don't get the maximally analytically extended Kerr solution there are infinitely many different things I can put across here, because analyticity is not a physical requirement. Well, you could just put boundary conditions that there's nothing come in, well, coming in I, at the... But, but then I'm adding something else. If I, so again, I'm not doing what I do in the rest of physics. Okay. I'm adding boundary conditions. Or how about anti-de-sitter space? So you say well, anti-de-sitter space is a breakdown of determinism. That's an initial boundary problem. That's, that's different. Okay. Defining it in a very particular way. It's clearly we want an initial value problem, not an initial boundary value problem. Okay, anti decider is different. Yeah. You impose spherical symmetry after also after the okay, that's, that's, that? uh, yeah, that's another if you impose spherical symmetry, then again that's another unphysical requirement because up to here spherical symmetry will be an output. Right, but, but does that pick the analytic value? Yes, because it's both upstairs. Yeah. So the point is that for Rice and Nordstrom, all of these smooth extensions would break spherical symmetry. But they're all perfectly smooth. Okay. Um, so, as I've explained, um, we have this um, reason to expect a large back reaction here, possibly causing the Cauchy horizon to be, to be replaced by a singularity, and that is essentially what strong cosmic censorship asserts. So here's a more formal statement of the conjecture, which is that if we consider complete asymptotically flat initial data for the, the Einstein-Maxwell equations, then generically the resulting solution cannot be extended across the Cauchy horizon as a C2 spacetime. C2 here means twice continuously differentiable, that's the, the minimum you might think you would need to make sense of the field equations at the Cauchy horizon. 
The key word here is generically. We've already seen that Kerr, Rice, and Nordstrom can be extended across a Cauchy horizon, but the point is that these spacetimes are non-generic. If you perturb them, then the resulting perturbed spacetime cannot be so extended. So if correct, then this conjecture restores determinism without invoking any kind of poorly understood physics, such as, for example, the back reaction of quantum effects. Okay, so the problem that we identified in classical GR is solved purely within classical GR. It's quite satisfying. Um, I should also say that this is unrelated to Penrose's weak cosmic censorship conjecture, which is essentially the statement that naked singularities don't form from collapse. In other words, singularities are always formed, are always enclosed by event horizons. So in spite of the names, the strong and the weak conjectures are actually logically independent. Okay, um, so is the conjecture true? So let me give you some of the evidence in its favour, so for Rice and Nordstrom. So um, early on, people looked at linear perturbations of Rice and Nordstrom, and they found that if you start off with some generic linear perturbation, then when you evolve it to the Cauchy horizon, this gradient diverges there, um, uh, so the energy density diverges there, so you might expect a large back reaction in agreement with what we've just discussed. Um, the first attempt to actually uh, calculate that back reaction was the, the model of Poisson and Israel in the early 90s. They looked at Einstein-Maxwell theory coupled to a form of matter they called null dust. So null dust is, is what it says, it's dust that moves along null rays. So it's a particularly tractable kind of matter to, to analyze um, uh, analytically. And they showed, uh, so this is a nonlinear model, and they showed that in this model, indeed, um, back reaction does cause the, the Cauchy horizon to become singular. Uh, so a curvature singularity is, uh, develops inside the black hole. Um, going beyond that to more uh, physical, perhaps, uh, models, or models which have got more wave-like features, um, uh, a very popular model which has been extensively studied by mathematicians over the last couple of decades is, is to perform a spherically symmetric uh, reduction of Einstein-Maxwell theory. Now, in Einstein-Maxwell, uh, in spherical symmetry, it, it's trivial because of Birkhoff's theorem. So to um, obtain some non-trivial dynamics whilst preserving uh, spherical symmetry, we have to introduce some extra matter. So you can introduce a scalar field, phi. And so this, this model has been uh, studied rigorously by mathematicians. And what they've done is they take Rice and Nordstrom, take the Rice and Nordstrom initial data on this surface sigma, and now they perturb it by introducing a small amount of scalar field on this initial surface. And then they can prove uh, theorems about what happens in the resulting spacetime. So what they've proved is that when you evolve the scalar field, the resulting spacetime can still be extended continuously across a, a Cauchy horizon like this. And so in particular, you can still define a Cauchy horizon in this perturbed spacetime, but um, the, that extension is not C2, so you cannot extend across a Cauchy horizon with, in, a, in a way which is twice continuously differentiable, so in other words, the Cauchy horizon is actually a curvature singularity. So this is a theorem, when you perturb um, Rice and Nordstrom with this small amount of scalar field in the resulting spacetime, what you get is a null curvature singularity instead of the, uh, the Cauchy horizon. And so that, that agrees with the, the conjecture. Um, perhaps surprising from the perspective of what was expected by Penrose and, and other people earlier on is that the singularity that forms when you perturb this black hole is globally null. Okay, so Penrose's expectation was that back reaction would cause the, uh, the, singular the, 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 the black hole to develop a singularity, which is a bit like the Schwarzschild singularity. In other words, a space-like singularity. But in fact, here, it's not space like anywhere. It's a globally null singularity inside the black hole. Can you replace the scalar field with gravitational waves? Good. Um, so let's not do this for Rice and Nordstrom. Let's do this for Kerr now. So um, again, this is very recent work by mathematicians, the Fermat and Luke, who've looked at um, the Kerr solution. So if you perturb the Kerr solution, um, it's expected that it's stable, although in fact this hasn't been proved. But if you assume it's stable and that the spacetime settles down to Kerr along the event horizon at the expected rate, what they can prove is that um, you can still 
extend across the Cauchy horizon at early time here, continuously. Um, what hasn't been proved, but which is expected, is that that extension will not be C2, and so this, this Cauchy horizon will actually be a null curvature singularity. And what's expected in the global case, if we did this for Kerr globally, uh, we perturb the metric on here a little bit uh, for Kerr, we would, what's expected is, is to get exactly this picture with a globally null uh, curvature singularity for a small perturbation of Kerr. Is, is there concept some conceptual understanding of why it should be null rather than space-like? Um, not really. Not, not, I, I don't have a simple way of, of, of explaining it. Um, and, and we expect it to hold for is this, gravity? Or this, or? This, well, well, one caveat is that this holds for small perturbations of two-ended initial data. If we were instead to continue a black hole... So small perturbations of what? Two-ended data. So data two-ended. Two, oh. With two asymptotic regions. Yeah. If we were instead to consider a black hole formed by gravitational collapse, this is, as in the case I've just discussed, you would get a small section of null singularity here, but what happens over here is not known. And it may well become space-like over there. So at least with the scalar field, it is known. Uh, not for, well, not for gravitational collapse. Yes, no. that was a paper that Ramesh and, and, and Eric and I just put out. Okay, recently. well, well, what I've been talking about is rigorous theorems in mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> that puts you in your place. <laughs> <laughs> but so we can, we can discuss we can discuss that. Uh, <laughs> Later. Um, <laughs> so there is an issue, which is that you, don't, that, that you could have another component of outgoing Cauchy horizon inside the black hole. Um, but I, I don't really have time to discuss that now, so maybe let's uh, talk about that later. Um, but, but small, just to be yeah. small means of fine, some finite neighborhood and some norm. Small, yeah, it's, exactly. It's, you're not linearizing it. No, you're not linear. linear. No, it's these are nonlinear theorems. Yeah. Um, and it's not me, this is, this is the firm of some collaborators. Um, so let me, in the last few minutes, come to what I've been thinking about recently, which is the role of the cosmological constant. Um, so, so far, everything I've mentioned is for zero cosmological constant, and with zero lambda, perturbations of a black hole exhibit power law decay. So these are the, the famous late-time tails of black holes caused by scattering uh, of perturbations of curvature of space-time. Um, but if we have um, positive lambda, then we now have a cosmological horizon, and uh, that causes things to decay faster, uh, so now one has exponential decay of generic perturbations of a, of a black hole, caused by the exponential expansion of space. So um, here's a, how long do I have? Uh, 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes, okay. So here's a, uh, the, the Penrose diagram for a Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter black hole. Um, so now it's a bit more complicated than we had before. So the reason is that we now have a cosmological horizon, which is this orange line here. So this region here is the region between the event horizon and the cosmological horizon. If we cross through the cosmological horizon, we get to this asymptotically de Sitter region, and this would be the uh, space-like space infinity of, of de Sitter space. Um, this is a, another asymptotic region with its own cosmological horizon, and this is the, the region inside the black hole as before. And so if we're looking at a Rice and Nordstrom or a Kerr black hole, then again we have this, this Cauchy horizon uh, inside the, uh, the black hole. Um, so we can uh, revisit the heuristic argument for the uh, instability of the Cauchy horizon in this picture. So again we have our two observers, Alice and Bob. Um, Alice is sending her signals to Bob. And again, there's this infinite blue shift at the, uh, the Cauchy horizon. Um, but now there's an important difference, which is that the signals at late time which Alice is sending to Bob are now also being redshifted. They're being redshifted because they have to climb out of the potential well associated with the cosmological horizon. Or if you like, they're being redshifted by the, the, uh, the exponential uh, expansion of space. And so now we have a red shift competing with the blue shift. And so it's not clear immediately which effect is going to win. And so this was first pointed out a long time ago by Mella and Moss. And there was quite a lot of work uh, studying this in the, in the 1990s. But can't you also consider an observer A that's moving towards the black hole yeah. and then climbing bound. out of the... Okay. Where, where, do want, of where do you want my observer to go? <laughs> okay, we can, yeah, the observer going up here, but there's still a redshift caused by the... No, 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 no. 
It's you have a planet around a black hole or yes, a star. Yes. It yeah. doesn't participate in the expansion of the universe because gravity binds okay. it. Okay. Well, what is still hole. true is that perturbations will still decay exponentially. No. Uh, no, they will. <laughs> it's, it's a theorem that, that small perturbations of the vicinity of black hole will decay exponentially. I, I don't think so because uh, they are not pulled out by the expansion. I mean, the, well, the perturber is still. I'm talking about li linear. Per this is a nonlinear effect we're talking about. If I look at linear perturbations of a vicinity black hole, and those perturbations will always decay exponentially. I'm just thinking about the star orbiting the black hole sure. and producing a perturbation. The expansion of the universe but, is but that, irrelevant. But that star is not a, I'm talking about fields. That star is not, not an object made of a, of, a, of a field propagating in this background. But I think Avi has an interesting yeah. point because he's talking about a situation which sure. scales rather differently when, yeah. you, when, you, when you go into the infinite future, right? Yeah. And you would think it would be more like the non-cosmological case. Um, so the fact that the universe expands doesn't matter for this star. Who cares? Yeah. Um, okay, I'm not sure how this is how this is going to be relevant for the story of the perturbations. In the itself. sense that you have perturbations of objects bound to black holes. But assuming they live forever. So what, what's going to what's going to be important here is that the object lives forever. So it's the late time behavior which is which is the relevant phenomenon. But let, let me let me set aside possible astrophysical situations and let's just think about um, Einstein Maxwell theory or, or, or pure gravity with a with a cosmological constant. But we don't have um, matter to, 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 to play that role. Um, so th this was studied in, in the nineties and the uh, the conclusion well, initially was that, that, that strong cosmic censorship might be violated in the CETA, but then this conclusion was um, withdrawn at the end of the 90s for reasons which turned out to be incorrect, as we now realise, but incorrect in an interesting way. So I will, I will explain why in my talk on Thursday. But now let me just jump to, uh, to what the recent work in this uh, area has been doing. So there's been a revival of interest in, in strong cosmic censorship with positive lambda. Um, so my, my interest was stimulated by a paper of Vittor Cardoso and these collaborators who looked at uh, scalar field perturbations of Rice and Nordstrom de Sitter. And they found, uh, they presented quite strong evidence, in my opinion, that a certain formulation of strong cosmic censorship, which is a bit stronger than the version I've, I've, I've been discussing, is actually violated near extremality. So we, so then together with Osh Sorry, Dears, what, what, what was extremality? Extremality, this is Rice to Nordstrom to Sitter. Extremality would mean large charge of the black hole. Okay. You mean where it's on the edge of getting a naked singularity without? Uh, yeah, where the two horizons are becoming degenerate. The, the black, two black hole horizons are becoming degenerate. So there'd be a maximal charge for a small to sit a black hole and we're close to that maximal charge. If you have a black hole which is far from extremality, then, then strong cosmic censorship is respected, uh, just as in the as in the flat space. Um, so together with George Santos and Oscar Diaz, um, I looked at uh, gravitational and electromagnetic perturbations of Rice and Ocean Sitter. And what we found is that um, Linear perturbations of, of this black hole are C2 at the Cauchy horizon, twice continuously differentiable, again, if the black hole is near extremal. Please remember C2 is what we wanted for strong cosmic censorship. So it appears then that if we have a Rice and Nordstrom to sit a black hole, which is sufficiently near extremal, then strong cosmic censorship is, is violated. And in fact, it seems to be worse than that, in the, in the sense that if you make the black hole near extremal and sufficiently big, in units of lambda, then you can make the generic linear perturbations at the Cauchy horizon as smooth as you like. You can make them r times continuously differentiable. And so if you have a sufficiently large near extreme or black hole, it seems that generic perturbations can be very smooth at the Cauchy horizon. And so strong cosmic censorship seems to be in trouble for Einstein Maxwell theory. Now, of course, highly charged Rice and Nordstrom black holes don't exist in the, in the real world. Um, and as I've uh, emphasized, mentioned, there's a similar uh, properties shared by Rice and Nordstrom and Kerr. 
So this may make one suspect that perhaps strong cosmic censorship is also going to be in trouble for an almost extreme occur to sit a black hole, uh, a black hole with almost maximum rotation. So we also looked at that, along with my student, Tosti Dnieperon. Uh, however, in this case, uh, surprisingly, we found that linear gravitational perturbations always uh, at the Cauchy horizon are always sufficiently lacking in smoothness to ensure that strong cosmic censorship is respected in this case. So it seems that we're in the, the curious situation where for, for positive lambda, strong cosmic censorship is violated in Einstein-Maxwell theory, but satisfied in, in vacuum Einstein gravity. So if you want to jump into a black hole and explore a new region of space-time, you're going to have to find a highly charged uh, black hole rather than a rapidly rotating one. Um, Maybe, okay. maybe you've proven that lambda doesn't survive forever. I've proved what lambda? La well, it's a vacuum energy state that can decay. Right? Well, I think that. After a while. Well, that, that's a speculation, right? Oh. Okay. What do you mean? We don't have a theory of lambda. Right. Do we? So maybe it decays, maybe it doesn't, we don't know. Um, Okay, so that's the end of this talk. If, you, if you're interested in coming to Thursday's talk, here's some extra content for that talk. I'll be discussing some different versions of strong cosmic censorship. I'll discuss the role of charged matter in Rice and Nordstrom. Um, there's an interesting story about non-smooth perturbations and how they might rescue strong cosmic censorship. And I'll say a little bit about a possible role for quantum effects in this uh, setting. So thank you for listening. to sit or even looking at linearized perturbations, you see curvature blow up or something like this. Mm -hmm. And in Riser, in Riser Nordstrom, close to extreme old that the sitter, but that's not the case. Is there a chance that if you look at nonlinear effects in Riser Nordstrom to sitter, that you do start to see these? these uh, it's possible, but um, as I said, if you make the black hole um, near extreme and big enough, you can make the, the linear perturbation as smooth as you like at the Cauchy horizon which suggests that the nonlinearities are going to be small. I mean, there's nothing, nothing seems to be blowing up there. So, uh, I mean, there's no theorem, but the linear, the linear perturbation is under, under good control. So there's no reason to expect nonlinearities to become large, but I agree, it's, it's something that, that one has to check. Eric? So there's evidence <coughs> that, um, it, that in, in these null singularities you talked about with, um, with the perturb, uh, in the perturbed current Roger Nordstrom, that they're at least for some part of the, um, along the singularity, they're weak in the sense of Tipler. Mm. You know, stuff doesn't get shrunk to zero volume. Mm. So in principle, one might think, well, you know, extended bodies can still pass through the singularity. Yeah. Is, that, is that an issue that's uh, that, that yeah, treated? Yeah, this, this comes perturbed? back to, uh, to this uh, formulation okay. of strong cosmic censorship, which I'll discuss on Thursday. But um, yeah, there is a formulation which, which is motivated, in fact, by, by that kind of consideration. In fact, this is the, the formula, the, I think the most satisfactory version of strong cosmic censorship. It's just a bit technical to explain what it is, so I, but it's motivated by, by issues like what happens to an observer crossing the Cauchy horizon. Uh, this, this, on this question, the same one that you had on your graph about four back or so, where you asked whether the red shift or the blue shift wins, mm -hmm. um, ignoring astrophysics, you, you want to make lambda, you can make it whatever magnitude you want, mm. or is it the case that because of the singularity at the horizon that lambda will become irrelevant? Well, all lambda is really doing is, is influencing the rate at which perturbations out here decay. So, so locally, lambda is not, not doing anything interesting out here. So the only role of lambda is, 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 is in the rate of decay of linear perturbations out here. And um, does this business about the singularity being null, is that also true for the perturbations of extreme current, or do you have to...? Uh, that's an interesting case. I could have spoken about that. So I, I did a little bit of work on this a few years ago. Um, so first, when you talk about perturbations of extreme current, you have to be a little bit careful about what kind of initial data you're going to consider. Um, and uh, um, well, okay, so putting that aside, generically, when you, per when you perturb extreme current, it will become non-extreme. Right. And then you'll get something like this, at least uh, up here, you'll get a bit of a usual uh, null singularity. But what, you can, what we showed is that if you can also do a fine tuning in, when you perturb an extreme black hole in such a way that the perturbed space time remains extremal. So 
So there's a notion of a time-dependent extremal space-time that, that you can uh, introduce, which is essentially the absence of trapped surfaces inside the black hole. And if you restrict to that class of space-times, you find that, in fact, the Cauchy horizon is a lot smoother. And so these time-dependent extremal black holes can be extended across the Cauchy horizon. Uh, but, of course, this is non-generic because we're, we're, we're restricting to externality. Okay, I think we should move on. Harvey will give a long version of the talk on Thursday. If you are interested and you don't know where to go, just ask me. And thanks. Let's have you. Have Well, uh, today I'm really delighted to introduce Yuri Kovalev. Uh, Yuri is a physicist at the Lebedev uh, Physical Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow, and he also heads the Laboratory of Fundamental and Applied Research of Relativistic Objects of the Universe at the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. Uh, Yuri is project scientist at Radio Astron, and this is an orbiter that extends this technique of very long baseline interferometry out to distances of the moon. Uh, improving the resolution you can do from the from the ground by about a factor of 30. And so today, he'll tell us about this mission and some of its results. It's the first one? First one? The first one to, to go to space and with the probe? No. Oh, no, there was. The, the first one was American. Uh, <laughs> and you must know that. No, I don't. Oh, you don't know. I'll tell you about that. Uh, okay, guys, I'll, I'll try to cover in the next 25 minutes, which is almost impossible, the space will be a mission radio astron and its scientific results. I will save a little bit of time on um, some of the things which are uh, done together with colleagues here in this room in the hope that if you're interested, uh, Michael and or uh, Jim will tell you more about it. Okay, so uh, now answering to your question because I was not going to talk about it in, in, in my presentation. So the proof of concept of space will be I was um, was done using the TDRSS um, American satellite, which was not used for its original purpose for some technical reasons, which you must know better than I do. And instead, NASA decided why don't we try doing space with that? And they didn't. There is even a science paper published on the basis of this experiment many years ago. So the very first space field BI was done by United States. I'm sorry to say that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the... Um, when was it? The 70s? It was 70s indeed, okay. yes. And then the first uh, scientific mission uh, was done by our Japanese colleagues. Unfortunately, there, are, there were two issues there. So number one, their orbit was about only two and a half times the Earth diameter, right? So you improve the Earth resolution only by coefficient of three, and their shortest wavelength, 1.3 centimeter, didn't work. So when, when it was launched, because of this terrible shaking of the thing when, when you launch it, so th there was a problem connecting the uh, feed horn with the rest of the receiver. So their shortest wavelength was six centimeters, so they were doing almost as good as we were doing with VLB, two centimeters, so it doesn't count. Okay, so we are talking today about Radio Astron, uh, which has uh, Build a virtual radio telescopes of the uh, telescope of the size of almost the distance to the moon. Thanks to that, we have the resolution uh, formally up to several microseconds at 1.3 centimeter. And these are the pictures of the telescope. So, in order to launch uh, a 10 meter uh, in diameter dish, you have to furl it as, as a flower, and that's what we have done. Then we launched it to the space from Baikonur in 2011 using a Russian-Ukrainian rocket, and several days later we have unfurled it. So this is the biggest ever launched to the space telescope, which is done not from a mesh structure, which is a solid structure. We even have a Guinness certificate because of that. <laughs> I thought that using it you can get Guinness for free, doesn't work, we try it. <laughs> uh, but not 10 meters. Oh, you're, you're, you're talking about the future. Uh, uh, who cares about the future? And you'll see how. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. 
Uh, okay, 10 meters, so we cover the uh, frequency bands or wavelength uh, basically between one meter and one centimeter. Doing different signs uh, with different bands. Okay, up to the moon, resolution. Okay, formal resolution, seven micro seconds. Uh, I'm very sad to tell that the formal, real, the real highest resolution was achieved not with active galactic nuclei, which I am doing, but with some mega maze right now. <laughs> uh, so we, we are using two tracking stations to get the data uh, from, from the space with the bitrate 128 megabits per second I underline from the distance up to the moon. Uh, in addition to that, uh, tracking stations are also used to measure the speed and also to uh, synchronize the space to the ground. A little bit more about that, we use two methods of synchronization using onboard hydrogen lasers built by Russians, it was actually the first active hydrogen laser which was space qualified, launched, uh, launched and was actually working properly for the first six years of our um, observations and after six years we switched to a backup method which is uh, using the ground laser, so a closed loop mode of synchronization is used since about one and a half years ago. We use three different software correlators to correlate our data and I underline these are three different programs which are using three different delay models and they are getting the same result if we compare it. Uh, recently we have counted the number of ground radio telescopes which have observed with us for the last seven and a half years, 58. I didn't think that so many exist on Earth. <laughs> and we counted VLBA as 10, but VLA as 1. So that everything is done properly. Mm -hmm. okay. um, open access since 2013, and it is not the, the first successful, not only the first successful astrophysical mission of Russia in its modern history, but also I think this first ever open Soviet or Russian mission, right, ever done. Uh, so everyone had equal opportunity to get the time, to apply for the time, we had international program committee, and to get the time, and we didn't have anything, you know, a, a, any fraction of the time specifically kept for Russians or I don't know, communists. <laughs> um, so, uh, raw data are stored for um, for reanalysis, and we do recorrelate some of our experiments. As of today, we have collected four petabytes of data. Uh, main science areas are quasars uh, and nearby exoplanetic nuclei, pulsars, laser scattering, gravitational redshift experiment. I will not talk about it today at all. Just would like to tell you that just within one single session, so we have clock on board the satellite. We can compare the clock in space and, and to, to the clock on the ground, and, and we can check the equivalence principle of the general re relativity theory. And within one experiment, we got a, an accuracy comparable to gravity probe A. We have altogether observed, um, I think, up to 50 sessions, and we hope to improve the accuracy by coefficient of 10. The data are being analyzed right now. Uh, about 250 targets observed, and uh, the most recent news, the uh, satellite uh, is not talking to us since January 10th of this year, after seven and a half years of operations. So expected lifetime was five years, it operated for seven and a half. Uh, the Russian Space Agency decided that uh, we will continue trying to establish communication by via I mean Lavochkin Association, which has built the satellite. You might not know the name, but you certainly know about the Soviet missions to the moon, to Mars, Venus, so it's all that, that company. Do, so, you, do you know what failed? Yes, uh, it is the transmitter. So we had three different transmitters um, on board the satellite, and it was the only one left. And uh, after seven and a half years, so basically I think that um, under space radiation, you expect this to happen sooner or later. So the last one has failed um, this January. They do expect that um, since the charged particles continue to hit the electronics, it might reboot and come back uh, into operations. It has happened before. Uh, that is why we have a few more months to try. Uh, apparently, probability is not very high, but we will try until May, and then if, it, uh, if you don't establish communication, if you don't get it back, then in May, it will be officially announced that the project is over. I mean, by over, I mean observation, right? Because talking about the collected data, we have at least three to five more years to reduce the data. What was the cost? What was the cost? Uh, before I answer this question, I will answer the question how, how heavy it is. It is about 4,000 kilograms. And the cost was officially announced by uh, by the Russian Space Agency to be 5 billion rubles by the time of the launch. Did it help you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, if I remember correctly, it is about 170 million dollars. Yes. Yeah. Including, including the rocket. Compared to gravity probe. 
Sure, of course. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, I okay. Financial questions are are not very easy, especially in my country. Uh, I, I guess it does not include the cost during the Soviet time, because the project has started in in early 80s, and uh, then uh, in the country collapsed, the project apparently collapsed together with the country, and then we got the oil prices back high, and um, some some money was spent on the project. I think that this only counted the money which was spent by Russia. It did not include the Soviet time. Okay. Um, uh, I immediately switch to uh, to science. I have many uh, slides on technical details, which I will not cover right now. But if someone has questions, I, I have something prepared. So the first uh, the first um, science key science program which we had uh, with Radio Astron is uh, so called Radio Astron Epigalactic Nuclei Survey, and its main goal was to measure and study brightness or brightness temperature, of course, in epigalactic nuclei in order to better understand its physics, trying to uh, take interstellar scattering into, into consideration. So uh, the story is the following. We, uh, there is a, a prediction, a theoretical prediction done about half a century ago that due to inverse Compton scattering, we do not expect cores of active galactic nuclei to be brighter than a certain limit. Because if you inject an extremely energetic particles in your jet, they will cool down through uh, inverse Compton catastrophe just within several hours. Okay? So you do not expect to see extremely high brightness or extremely high brightness temperature from active galactic nuclei. You can. You might see, let's say, sometimes when you when you were lucky to observe your object just at the moment when this you know, block of particles was in, injected in the jet. But if you study a sample, you don't expect to see this kind of um, brightness level very often. Okay? And uh, what was done before uh, nicely uh, confirms this prediction. So you see here the uh, histogram of um, measurements of the brightness temperature at VLBA at 15 gigahertz. This is one of the most recent result. I mean, we, uh, it, it uses one. It uses the data set from I think last year, 2018, uh, by our team. And you see that the typical brightness temperature is on the level of 10 to the 12 Kelvin, and maximum goes up to 5, 10 to the 13. The Japanese Space VBI project did a similar survey, and they received comparable results. And all fits very nicely into prediction of the theory because you expect the intrinsic brightness temperature limit on the level of 10 to the power and 11 and a half Kelvin to be boosted typically by coefficient of 10 through relativistic uh, boosting, not more than that. So everything fits nicely, please. Could there be an emitting region in an AGN that's shielded from soft photons that would uh, give you this inverse Compton cooling? Mm, as far as I understand, no, I, yes, the word shielded is a little bit problematic to me. I'm not sure what do you mean by this. But, but it's important to point out that this is true for uh, incoherent emission, because in fast radio bursts you have 10 to the power 34 you're, Kelvin. You're absolutely correct, and you're discussing the next but one slide of mine. Okay. Right <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so as far as I understand, the answer is no. Okay, but let, let's discuss it later if I didn't understand your question correctly. But everything was, was coming very nicely into, into this picture. Be, uh, however, the problem is that neither ground-based observations nor uh, the uh, space field BI with, with small space baselines can check this level of brightness. Because even if extremely bright quasars exist, uh, this level cannot be measured neither from the ground nor from a uh, short baseline space UBI. You have to launch your satellite to very long orbit in order to be able to probe these um, this brightness temperature uh, levels. And this is what, what was done by Radio Astron. And here you can see um, the result. We have observed a sample of about 250 active galactic nuclei in 3,000 experiments, and every experiment or every session was one hour long at uh, different projected spacing, starting from short ones coming to about 28 <coughs> Earth diameters. 
and uh, at 18 and or 6 and or, or 1.3 centimeter. And you can see here a result, so the highest formal resolution was achieved for several very well known targets, and the histograms on the bottom show to you what we have found. So we have measured the brightness temperature levels up to the level of 10 to 14 Kelvin, and the typical val values at 11 and 10 to the 13. Important here is to show all three histograms because there is special, again discovered by radio astron effect, which in principle can result in um, overestimating the brightness temperature levels. <coughs> However, we do not expect this to be uh, sig uh, very significant uh, at 6 centimeters, and we certainly don't expect this to play a significant role at, at 1.3 centimeters. And at all three histograms, you see comparable levels of emission, comparable level, levels of brightness. So now the question comes, how can we generate these extreme brightness temperature levels, which are at least 10 times brighter than what is predicted by the theory on, and what we thought before? So one, one option is that we underestimate the level of Doppler boosting. So most of the jets look at us with the observing angle several degrees. Uh, however, from VLBI kinematics, we can estimate the Doppler boosting, and uh, it's typically 10, so it has to be 100 in order to explain our results. This is a big problem, because if it is typically 100, we should throw away results of UBI kinematics measurements which have happened during the last 30 years. It is extremely painful, and we don't see any uh, reasons to do that from, from, from our kinematics measurements. Another option is that you all right, you have Compton or inverse Compton catastrophe, but you somehow have a process which far away from the central, most probably supermassive black hole, somehow reaccelerates your particles. Why far away? Because I remind you that we observe at relatively long radio wavelengths, 18, 6, 1.3 centimeter. Due to synchrotron self-absorption, we do not see very close to the central nucleus. So all of this bright features which we have detected must be located parsecs away from the central nucleus. So there must be something accelerating them, like uh, magnetic reconnection. But then the issue is that we should see uh, many more um, gamma ray bright AGN, or the level should be higher than we see. It might be that, the, that all of these photons are upscattered to X-rays and not to gamma rays. But still, uh, it, it's, it's not very easy to check if magnetic reconnection is actually play there, but it might be one of the um, options how to accelerate it. And the last but not least is what I just said, right? Is relativistic products or coherent processes, right? And uh, we always were taking this as something extreme uh, when we are talking about AGM, and coherent processes looks truly extreme because it requires extremely high magnetic field at least, which we don't see, but usually we are model dependent when we are discussing it, but so this, this is, would truly be difficult. Another option is that instead of relativistic electrons, we see synchrotron radiation from relativistic protons. But th there still the problem is how to accelerate protons to relativistic um, energies, to relativistic uh, speed, and um, uh, there, is no, there is no easy answer to this question. So different people prefer different uh, explanations for what we see, and there is no final answer yet. Yes, I, I, would there be a... It does it depend on just the size of the agent to generate a large enough uh, potential difference in order to accelerate the large protons? Would you be more likely if you could have a more extended uh, electric field and then you can... As far, as far as I understand, I mean, if, if you're talking about the length of the region, mm -hmm. we, are, we are doing fine there. Uh, here, when I'm talking that it is difficult, I, I refer to theoreticians with whom I have discussed the problem of accelerating protons, and they are basically telling to me that they believe it is very complicated. Okay? That's what I mean. Uh, okay, now, the next thing which I want to discuss briefly is that we did not plan when we were uh, talking and we, when, when, we were, when we were scheduling and discussing the radio astron AGN survey, we didn't plan to do any polarization. So we didn't put any polarization calibration into this observation because it would take a lot of observing time. However, nature has um, decided for us that we will do polarization even not uh, calibrating for it. So it turned out that uh, if you go 
from short to long and then very long spatial gap projected spacings, the cross term, the linear polarization starts to win against the Stokes I correlated flux density. We were stupid enough not to think about it when we were planning this thing, but we were smart enough to catch it when we actually got the signal, and we realized that in, um, in, in a significant number of active electric nuclei, actually in many which we detect for long and very long space field BI uh, baselines, we see a rise a, um, of dramatic rise of linear polarization with project very long baseline in quasar course. And this is a plot from the paper by Michael Johnson and collaborators. That is why I'm not going to spend time on discussing it because this paper is from this team. So I, I trust that you all know very well this paper. And it, it basically explains to you that if you have, um, let's say in your quasar, you have the core which has, okay, I simplify this size, and then you have uh, some sub feature in the core which is smaller, this, this is exactly what you expect to see from your VLBI data. Or you have several uh, smaller components within your, within your core, within your base of the in IGN. So from this, we can conclude the highly ordered magnetic field in a single or multiple, very compact regions within the core uh, can explain the data. And also there is so some sort of technical, important technical uh, warning um, for future space VLBI missions. If you go on the ground or in space to very high resolutions, you must care about polarization very much because it is going to bring uh, to deliver to you a lot of interesting new results. Might be even more than from the stop side. Okay, now to imaging, 3C84. Uh, so this is an image of 3C84, which we got with radio astronaut 1.3 centimeter. So this is the base of the jet. This already is part of the counter jet. Uh, the black hole is pro probably somewhere here. This is a zoom on this region. So there are two interesting things here which I would like to point your attention to. One is that you see that the jet is empty inside, so it is completely dark inside, and we believe that we see um, a very clear sign of uh, plasma stratification here. So due to um, relativistic aberration, the plasma in the center of the jet is, uh, is having higher speed, so its beam, uh, beam of, of its radiation is, uh, is narrower, and so all the synchrotron radiation which comes from the spine of the jet does not reach the observer, because the observing angle of 3C84 uh, jet is about 20 to 30 degrees. And so you only see um, the uh, edges of the jet which are uh, moving at slower speed. Uh, even more interesting is that the very base of the jet is measured to be extremely wide. Uh, it is um, at least of an order of several hundred Schwarzschild radii. And it is important because um, um, you, you might remember that um, the jet formation, for, so for, for very many years, we thought the blanford znaik mechanism is working in ex galactic nuclei jets, so that the central supermassive black hole is dominating in, in the jet formation process. And blanford pain which assumes that accretion disk might play a significant role, was only considered for like jets of microquasars or, or objects like this. And so here, there is no way you can generate the very base of the jet of 3C84 being so wide, several hundred, if not a thousand Schwarzschild radii, if uh, accretion disk does not play a significant role. So basically we have found the first example um, when uh, blanford pain mechanism is working in ectoblastic nuclei. Could the disk be very thin, and then that just gives you... Uh, you you're talking, if, uh, could it be that both a supermassive black hole and the Christian disk, yes, it could be the case. Yes. It is very difficult to, t uh, to prove that the black hole is not part of the game. But it is the first example that the Christian disk plays a significant role in the jet formation process for an active nuclear. Okay, I was told that I have five minutes left. Uh, I... 3C273. We have found, very unexpectedly, extreme stratification of the jet. So let, let me try to explain to you. So on the right-hand side, in contours, you see uh, the ground-based image at two centimeters of, of the jet of 3C84. 
On top of that, in color, you see 18 centimeter image of the jet coming from radio astron. And you see that uh, the shift of the jet is becoming visible here very well. On the left hand side, in contours, you see the same 18 centimeter radio astron data. And in color, 6 centimeter radio astron data. So just having difference by coefficient of 3 in observing frequency of the space will be interferometer radio astron, you see this jump between jet being dominated by its emission coming from the edges to the jet which is visible only along the spine. So it is actually very difficult to explain. And this limb brightening at 18 centimeters in, in, at 18 centimeters and only seeing the spine in six, it requires either a very strong uh, differential doctor boosting, so very strong gradient in velocity between the central part of the jet at the edges or some steep uh, energy stratification. Both very, very difficult actually to imagine and to explain what we see. Uh, M87, I couldn't resist from showing to M87, but not at very short wavelengths. Unfortunately, we didn't have any detection 1.3 centimeter, most probably because the base of M87 at 1.3 is, uh, is truly opaque. And so because of that, it doesn't look compact enough for us. I just wanted to show to you that we see wiggles in the jet of M87 and zooming in the jet, uh, seeing this spiral even clearer. Most probably we see here uh, plasma instabilities growing in jet. It's like a DNA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is the first comment like that. I didn't think of it. I, I, I remember that. Yeah, it, 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 you, you can sell it well to journalists. Um, <laughs> I'll refer to you. Uh, but, but speaking seriously, right, so it is probably the only example of radio astron data around which all the theories have agree that yes, it must be instabil plasma instability in the jet. Okay, we do polarization. This is just an um, example of polarization result of 3C84 on uh, BLR, <coughs> sorry. And in, in, in the base of BLR jet we see uh, a gradient of Faraday, Faraday rotation, which the science team was able, it's Jose Luis Gomez and its collaborators already published, so I can put the reference here. Uh, within their numerical uh, 3D RMHD simulations, they were able to repeat this uh, observational result, assuming that the uh, structure of magnetic field in the jet base is um, toroidal. Very quickly, uh, I trust that Jim will tell you more about that. So this uh, record-breaking resolution is coming from NDC 4258, and uh, conclusions from that, that individual components of maser emission, of water maser emission, uh, are probably even unresolved with this uh, baseline and should have size less than 3 microseconds, and the thickness of the accretion disk should be around 10 microseconds. Uh, okay, so discovery of the scattering substructure. This is uh, my last but one slide. Very unexpectedly, this is what we didn't uh, think we will get from radio astron, and actually th there is a story about observing pulses with radio astron. You understand that having one meter large band in your satellite takes a lot of space and weight. And we had many debates before launching radio astronauts if we should have such a long uh, wavelength band uh, on the satellite. And the argument was that, I mean, guys, you will not see anything at one, at, at one meter because AGN are, are huge, you will not detect them, and everything is scattered, and your beloved pulsars are scattered, you most probably will detect them up to a few Earth diameters at best. But uh, the ones of you who know Kardashev understand that um, uh, he is not only extremely lucky, but also extremely, what's the right English word, stubborn. Yeah. So <laughs> he basically ignored all these comments, and so he had this one meter uh, band um, on, on our satellite. And here is what has actually happened. So this is what everybody expected. So this is the dependence of correlated flux density versus projected baseline. So this is the ground measurements, and everything here is the space at 92 centimeters. And this is what we expected from the scattering disk of the size of three and a half meter seconds from this particular pulsar. However, yes, these points sit at this curve, at this predicted curve very nicely. But then, when you go to longer projected spacings, you see um, a constant line. So the, instead of not detecting any signal, because it is 
well below your detection limit, you, we have detected almost all strong pulsars which we have observed with radio astron at any projected baseline. We couldn't understand what it is for about a year. And then uh, finally we realized that uh, we have discovered a new scattering effect. Yes. Uh, which we call, and it's very difficult to sell actually to anyone, and Michael also complains about that, scattering substructure, and now comes the moment when I try to explain it. So, as far as I understand, and he is the one, and, and okay, these two guys, right, Ramesh and, uh, and Michael are supposed to understand it, truly understand it. Um, so, your pulsar emission goes through turbulent cloud in our galaxy, and different turbul turbulent cells in the cloud they generate, they generate like multiple images of the same pulsar. And then interference of these many images of the same pulsar results in tiny dots, which you observe on top of the scattered image of your source. So how well was it, Michael or Ramesh? Thank you, they are very, they are very nice. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. The, the, the nice thing about this particular result was that since it does not depend on the source of radio emission, there, there was a prediction that you should see this effect, this scattering effect from other objects as well. And we have observed it even from the ground. We have observed such a star from the ground using VLBA and GBT. And here you see the result. And here is the prediction for, for the scattering size. And again, we have detected at relatively low level, the same effect using ground-based data. Why is it interesting? It apparently it gives you a new tool to probe turbulent interstellar medium. Uh, you must be careful taking this effect into account while understanding your uh, VLBI data from an inter interferometer which has very high resolution, either space VLBI or even wet horizon telescope. And hopefully it gives you a new promising tool to reconstruct the true image of observed background tra target if you are able to understand very well your uh, cloud which results in this effect. And this is my last slide. Uh, so you, you have heard that most probably radio astron is finished uh, observationally. So our, our team in Russia is working right now on the next generation space will be a mission, which is millimetron, which is the same 10 meter in diameter, but working at uh, short millimeters and even shorter as a single dish and space field VI. Thank you. <laughs>
a spine is moving with a speed which is three, at least three times higher than the speed of the plasma in the shift. Uh, in the same time, uh, there are already even publications which show that there might be Kelvin gangrene sensitivities observed in MH7. So, these high brightness temperatures, that's a very dramatic result. So, I want to know exactly what you are measuring. Is this directly by just looking at an image and looking at just the brightness and the wavelength, or are you including anything else like variability? Or Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I will use one of the slides which I decided to skip. So this, uh, for, 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 uh, for our, our colleagues which are, which are doing this kind of measurements, uh, when they see this example, it, it, it is truly very sad for them. So, uh, so this is correlated flux. Uh, this comes from radio astron imaging observation of BLAC, which I have shown to you discussing polarization property, properties. But the contours have, have shown the stocks I image, and these are the data which were used to reconstruct that image. So all these data come from the ground observations, and all of that is radio astron detections. And the red color shows to you result of modeling of uh, visibility data uh, if you ignore the space field VI measurements. I mean truly ignore, so that the ground-based image was reconstructed knowing nothing. Hybrid imaging was done knowing nothing about space field VI. And uh, so this, this red curve shows to you what you get. And uh, so you see that you very strongly underestimate the correlated flux density at space field guide baselines. And uh, doing that, you measure the size of the core to be quite, quite small at the level of 40 microseconds. And, and this is the brightest temperature which you get from it. If you include the space field guide data into the measurements, that is what you get. In this particular case, you, you, you don't resolve the core. It turns out to be less than 10 microseconds in the brightness temperature here, um, higher than 2 times 10 to the 13 Kelvin. So th this is an example of what we are actually doing. Now, answering specifically your question, within AGN survey observations, typically we measure several data points along the way within either orbits which are nearby, we try to schedule sources within a given orbit or several orbits in the way, and then for some objects we do even monitoring measurements and then we observe in this year, next year, and then year after that. So, after measuring this correlated flux, this is on no phase information because you cannot, you don't have triangles very often uh, because of different reasons. So after measuring it, we fit simple Gaussian into the data, and then we get the brightest temperature. That, that is what I have shown to you. The problem is that when you have very long projected spacings, you cannot be sure that the data points which you measure here are the same as data points which you measure here. But then you can estimate the lower limit on the brightness temperature, assuming that uh, you're basically having the worst case scenario when the parameters of the Gaussian give you the lowest brightness temperature. Even if you do that, and we measure that as well, you will get the brightness temperature which is significantly higher than what you get from the ground measurements. So one follow-up. If I looked at this data, and I just said I got one unresolved component, just a flat visibility, unresolved on this baseline, and this is the flux of that component. Would that pretty much give you the same brightness temperature? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That is the brightness yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, you really don't need all of this stuff. You don't. This is where all the information Absolutely is. correct. Okay. Absolutely correct, yes. That's small scale. Yeah. Yes, you are absolutely right. right. Yes. Okay, last question, John. Uh, um, so I actually have a question about your last slide, another metron. It's a technical I, I thought last slide was with Kardashian, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, question so it's just a technical, my, my, my interest is technical. So millimetron is going to be, you skipped over it, but millimetron is going to be what wavelengths exactly? And the other question is, what's the structure around the dish? Is that is that thermal or side load, side load mitigation? Okay. So <coughs> millimetron, as a, millimetron as a single dish yeah. is going to, okay, the plan is right now to observe up to 2 terahertz. Yeah. The millimetron as an element of a space field BI interferometer or, or ground to space interferometer yeah. uh, will go at least down to 0 0.7 millimeter. Cool. Okay. 
Now, this structure around. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so so th these structures around are um, passive cooling um, shields. Okay. So every shield uh, uh, passively cools it to lower and lower temperatures. Then you come to very low temperature here. And then the plan is, which I believe technically is extremely challenging. Uh, is to actually cool even the dish down to very low temperatures. Uh, cool. Okay, so Yuri is around just for the rest of the day. If there are more questions, but uh, let's thank him again. How many rubles is this? <laughs> oh, this, this, this is a hundred ruble question. <laughs>